the Tie Cats Audio Network. This is the CFL This Week with Bubba O'Neill. 1,415 days later, the Elks hand their fans a gift, but will it be a gift that keeps on giving? Can anyone contain Chad Kelly and the Argos growing fan base? Hey, the butler did it in BC. And folks, what is your favorite Labor Day memory? Let's have some fun. The CFL this week kicks off on the Thai Cats Audio Network. I'm your host, Bubba O'Neill. Thanks for being a part of the best weekly CFL chat in the business. Now, here to inform, entertain, and give their opinions are these men. Folks, he was one of the best at his position, and he's maintained that same quality at TSN as a game analyst. Dwayne Ford, we certainly appreciate you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. You know, this fella has also made the smooth transition from the football field to the broadcast booth, TSN Radio in Montreal. Bonjour, Marco Briette. Hey, hey, what's going on? And folks, he is well known for covering that Winnipeg sports scene, which seemingly is so easy with the Blue Bombers from the Free Press. Great to have you, Taylor Allen. Thanks. I wish I had the the playing resume as, as Marco and, and Dwayne, but uh, <laughs> at least I got the writing thing going for me, I guess. There's nothing wrong with being one of us media guys. Come on now. You know, All right. with, the, with the playing resume comes a sore joints too. So I, I think you may be winning on this one. Fair point, fair point. <laughs> yeah, there's no ice tub for us there, Taylor. <laughs> All right, guys, here it is. The Elks' long losing streak is over, Dwayne. Now, this is back-to-back victories. Are they a team to be feared with in the second half? Yeah, fear might be a little bit of a strong word, but I, I certainly think that respected is uh, it would be fair. They've uh, they've proven themselves to be obviously a team that that can compete. Trey Ford has made a difference for them at quarterback. I think has given them, um, you know, in three games. I don't necessarily want to call it stability, but I think what he's given them is is confidence and belief that I think that the the team was losing a little bit before and. You know, that's by no means a shot at, at Taylor Cornelius. I think a, a tough situation for him that I think that, that his own confidence was broken and I think that was starting to be starting to be reflected in the rest of the team. But um, but there's no question there's some talent there. It doesn't hurt when you get Geno Lewis back at uh, at the same time either. And so, you know, getting, getting a couple of key pieces like that into your lineup um, certainly makes you a much more competitive team than they demonstrated in the first half of the season. But the confidence piece is huge to me, guys. Taylor, it wasn't a win, but all of a sudden you could maybe see a change in the franchise and their approach, their offense, playing the Bombers, and then they ended up losing. But do you see some improvement in this team and someone that could maybe threaten maybe even Calgary for a playoff spot in the West? Yeah, I do. I do for sure. And, and that's kind of the, the beauty of the CFL where you can start the season, you know, 0-9 and, and you're technically still not out of it yet. But but you know what? Good for Edmonton, right? I mean, I was at the, the game the Bombers played in Edmonton a couple weeks ago and just there was no atmosphere at the game, right? Like the fans are, they were embarrassed of their team and the product and whatnot. But now with Trey Ford, what he's doing now winning two games in a row, there's something to talk about with, with this team. So it's going to be it's gonna be interesting to see what they do. Uh, in, in the coming weeks here. But yeah, I think it's safe to say, though, that Trey Ford might be the most exciting player in the league right now, which is a great thing for the CFL in general and, of course, Edmonton. Mark, are your thoughts? You know, I don't know if I would describe them as feared. Uh, I think I would instead use the word dangerous. Uh, you know, I know Chris Jones. I know that he's not afraid to make personnel moves. And with the season that this franchise has been having, you know, these guys are playing for jobs. I've been in those locker rooms. Uh, you know, I've had to endure some losing seasons. And when you start getting into those fall months and it becomes clear that, may, you know, you might still have an outside shot at the playoffs or you may be completely ruled out, those guys start playing for jobs. And sometimes that's the fire that a guy needs lit under his behind, uh, you know, to kick things into gear and get going. And so depending what happens over these next couple of weeks, uh, we could see some guys going out there playing for jobs in fear that they may un- end up on the street, whether before the end of the season or early in the off season. You know, Dwayne, a lot of the talk was this hashtag uh, free Trey Ford. <laughs> and that was kind of going around the league. Um what is it about this young man that impresses you? Uh, 
obviously the the fact that he is he's learned he's developed we knew that there was going to be a, a learning curve and i know this is certainly something marco could speak to as a as a former u sports quarterback that you know there's a big jump in terms of the speed of the game and some of the things that you're you're being asked to process and so when we go back to where he got i would say rushed into action in the the opening game against bc in 2022 to now you see a, a much more composed guy a guy i think with a, a greater understanding and sense of of all that's going on around him uh so that's one of the big things but for him as a player obviously the the thing that just jumps off the page at you is his athleticism his explosiveness um there have been tons of athletic guys that have played quarterback in this league but there haven't necessarily been a lot that you would label as explosive as trey ford if you were to line up all the quarterbacks in the history of the canadian football league on the goal line and and tell them that they're going to have a race over 40 yards trey ford just might win that race and that's that's saying something when you look at some of the the all-time runners but he's he's that kind of athlete so you combine that with a guy who i think he was 83 percent 15 of 18 throwing the yeah. ball uh in his last game that uh that that becomes a, a scary combination when he presents those kind of issues with both his legs and his arm Taylor, all of a sudden, these back-to-back -back meetings uh, over Labor Day uh, against the Calgary Stampeders, if you're the Stampeders, it's red alert. No, absolutely. And Trey Ford, we, we all knew that he was going to be a good athlete, right? Like, that, that's been the story of him for since he, you know, arrived on the scene, basically. But the, what's impressed me the most is, you know, just his decision-making with the ball. Like, he's making all the throws, too. Like, he's he's not just a guy that could run. He's not just a short yardage quarterback. Like, this is a guy who can – he can play in the CFL. And, you know, we saw it last year with Nathan Rourke, a Canadian, doing what he did. And, and now it's it's no, no longer um, – out of the norm to see Canadians do, uh, you know, playing at this high level at that position, which I think is just obviously fantastic for for the CFL. You know, guys, when you take a look at this, I think from a structural standpoint of the football game in all three aspects, it is amazing to show or to see that when you get Marco consistency on offense, all of a sudden that Elks defense that was so criticized all of a sudden they start to look really good because they're not on the field all the time. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. I mean, when you can count on your offense to go out there and put some points on the board and put you in some favorable positions and not feel like you're playing with your back against the wall every time you step out on the field, it allows you to loosen up a little bit, play with a little bit more of that swagger, play it a little looser, a little faster, a little more aggressive. And that's something that the Elks defense will be able to benefit from uh, with the way the offense has improved over the last couple of weeks. And to, to go back to Trace, Trey Ford specifically, you know, uh, I think we have to mention that I think what we're seeing is the product of an improvement in the level of competition and coaching uh, at the U sports level that we now have guys that, especially at the quarterback position so early in their professional careers, are able to step onto the field and have success. And, you know, there's a lot that goes into it. You talk about uh, a lot of private coaching as well. We mentioned Nathan Wark. We all know that he works during the offseason with a private quarterback coach. A lot of, of these Canadian quarterbacks seem to be investing more time in resources in developing themselves outside of the structure of their respective university teams because they now realize that it's actually feasible. It's a reality that they may get a shot at the next level at playing quarterback, which was not the case a couple of short years ago. You know, to Marco's point there, Dwayne, I think of a name, and I know you're the big Western alum, I think of a name by the name of Hillock. And uh, he looks like uh, he could be a real good one. Yeah, I mean, there, there are a number of guys in Canadian university football right now. As Marco said, guys that have, have done things along the way on their own in terms of their development. I think that even at the U sports level, I think that one of the things that you're starting to see is more dedicated quarterback coaches as opposed to quarterbacks who are being coached by just by the offensive coordinator or don't really have a position coach per se, that they're actually getting specific quarterback skill training that, that yeah, a, a generation ago wasn't the case for, for quarterbacks at Canadian universities. And so, yeah, Evan Hillock is a guy who's been successful at Western and is, and is one of those names. Um, 
certainly that you'll you're here mentioned. Um, LOL Laton Dress Regimbald at McGill is is another guy, certainly the U Sports Rookie of the Year a year ago. Uh, terrific player at the SEJEP level and now doing the same thing in U Sports will be another one to keep an eye on. A couple of Canadian quarterbacks still south of the border um, at D1 schools as well that uh, that we'll be watching over the, the next few years. But but yeah, for the U Sports guys in particular, it's I love the doors that are being opened by by Trey Ford and the success that he's having. Can I just ask you, Marco, on this? Because you could speak to this. The fact that Trey made it no secret that he wasn't going to play safety. He wasn't going to be a DB. He wasn't going to be a wide receiver. And he was pretty vocal with that. With the improvement of the Canadian quarterbacks at that, at, you know, being Canadian and being a quarterback, can these guys, is Trey set the stage for others right now to say, I'm not going to be something else. I want to be a quarterback. Well, you know what? I, I think that's a very subjective question, uh, and it's a case, it, it should be evaluated on a case by case basis. Uh, you know, you have some guys like myself uh, who are ready to do anything for the opportunity to play professional football, whether that was you know under center on the defensive side of the ball as a receiver. It didn't matter. I was just looking for that opportunity, but. You know, it's pretty impressive what Trey Ford did. He stuck to his guns. Uh, he believed in himself and, and he put it out there that, that that's what he wanted to do. Now, do I expect every other quarterback that's eventually going to come out in the CFL draft to take that stance, you know, right out of the gate and say, Hey, yeah, I'm a, if you're going to draft me or if you're going to take a shot on me, I only intend on playing quarterback. No. Um, but, you know, at, at the same time, it's a decision that's left to everyone. Uh, and if that's the route they choose to go, uh, so be it. Hopefully they can back it up. And so far, despite it only being a small sample size, it does appear as though Trey Ford is backing up what he said a couple of years prior. All right, let's switch it up, guys. The Hamilton Tiger Cats went into Vancouver and let's be honest, they shocked the Lions. James Butler was unbelievable in that game, coming out of the backfield and, of course, running running the football. Taylor, I'll throw this to you. The Tiger Cats have shown an ability because I believe Butler is leading the league in rushing. Can you be a rushing team in the Canadian Football League and be successful? Hamilton better hope so because I think that's really their only hope right now. I mean, we're on the Tiger Cats audio network, so I should be careful with my words here, but I mean... They've been so disappointing this year. There were such high expectations for this team heading into this year, and I know Bo got hurt and whatnot, but it's been a mess, right? And like you said, like they sh they shocked the world by beating the Lions, especially coming off of a week where they just lost to Edmonton. But, I mean, the good news is, yeah, James Butler, he, he's playing really well. I mean, if you want a silver lining, for sure. I think it was week seven and eight, he, he was getting bottled up pretty good. He was only averaging two yards per carry in these last, and he says two games in a row now with over 100 yards. Um, and he's averaging over five and a half yards per carry these last couple of games as well. So, so keep giving that guy the rock because until they kind of can get some better play at quarterback or that's probably their own that's kind of their, their best bet so but uh but in all honesty though do i think you can be a contender by just leaning on the run not so much i think it's been proven you know especially these past couple of years you look at the teams that have won the great cup uh you know toronto last year and uh winnipeg obviously a couple of years before that that you, you need both you can't just be a one-dimensional offense so, so it's gonna be an uphill uh, climb for uh, hamilton for sure Dwayne, can you have that balance? I mean, uh, I think when the run sets up the pass, especially when your quarterback is a young QB. Yeah, that's the thing. You've got to be able to to build off of it um, and develop some of your pass game based on the run, whether it's play action, bootleg, any of those sorts of things that that allow you to move the pocket around and and create some misdirection for the defense. But I think what's going to be interesting just in terms of their – maybe the consistency of what they do is I'll be watching for that, that bigger sample size as the, the BC game was Scott Milanovic's first game as the offensive coordinator. And I think that it was hard for BC to anticipate what they were going to see. Quite frankly, they were 
probably preparing somewhat for what Hamilton's offense had been through the first part of the season under Tommy Condell, probably preparing a little bit for things that they had seen Scott Milanovic do in the past. And I think they got a little bit of maybe some new wrinkles that Scott Milanovic has has added to the package. So as time goes on and teams have a little bit more of a, a library of film, they're going to have to be able to adapt. And, and not to say that running the ball may not be front and center for them. I look at the success that, that Calgary has had for a number of years as, as a team that's been pretty good at running the football. Um, and so I think it's going to be a matter of, of what is, what's their next move in the chess match, because I think teams are going to adapt to them running the ball. And that's the thing about uh, Milanovic, Marco, is that his success, I mean, it, it's well-documented. And a lot of it is short passing and running the football. And I, and I guess this could continue for the Tiger Cats, again, as they continue to develop a young quarterback. Yeah, and I think historically, if you go back, uh, the Hamilton Tie Cats over the past couple of years uh, have never really used their tailback uh, in the traditional sense where they were going to turn around and hand the football off to them. They like to have guys who can motion out of the backfield, run routes in space. I mean, they would often opt to throw screens or quick passes uh, and consider those runs in their offense as opposed to simply handing the football off to their tailback. And yeah, you know, Butler carried the football 18 times last week, which is a pretty big number, uh, for a tie cats offense. But when you look at the stats, I mean, he's tied for the lead, uh, for the team lead with 39 receptions. Uh, and now obviously this was pre Scott Milanovic. Um, but I expect Scott to, to work with the personnel that he has. Uh, work to their strengths and continue doing what they do and, and to have the ability to get James Butler out in space, get him matched up against some linebackers, uh, out in the open field where, you know, where they're not going to have any help and they got to be able to flip their hips. Uh, that can create a lot of trouble for, for opposing defenses. And, you know, I got an opportunity to see Scott work firsthand. He was the offensive coordinator when I first arrived, uh, in Montreal in 2010. And obviously I faced him on several occasions while he was uh, with the Argos organization. And so I anticipate that he's going to work to the strength of his guys, all the while trying to manage his young quarterback, uh, you know, in Taylor Powell, who's seen some ups and downs after being thrust into action with injuries to not only Bo Levi Mitchell, uh, but also to back up Matthew Schiltz. Folks, you got to apologize, and I've said this to you guys. They are actually removing my balcony at this point right now. It is a lot of noise, but regardless. Taylor, uh, we talk about winning, and we talk about losing, and how losing can continue losing. Maybe winning can breed some winning for the Hamilton Tiger Cats as well. It could, but, I mean, you look at their next four games, they're playing Toronto twice and Winnipeg once, so... That's as tough as a schedule as there there probably is right now. So, so we'll see. We're going to learn a lot about this team in, in the coming weeks. Um, you know, Scott Milanovic, he's only you know taking the OC job for a couple of weeks now. So we'll see how this offense continues to evolve and get better week after week. But um, but yeah, in four weeks from now. Um, I know I, I kind of bashed Hamilton already, but in four weeks from now, I might even have some more harsh words uh, to, to say, considering uh, how this next month how, how this next month goes. But uh, but we shall see. Well, we shall see is the Toronto Argonauts and Dwayne. Right now, they are being led by Chad Kelly, the quarterback. Uh, I think we were kind of leaning on Zach Caleros in the early part of the season as the favorite to repeat his MOP. I guess that would be three in a row. Uh, has Chad Kelly stolen that honor from him, even though we are at the midway part of the season? Well, before I answer that, I first want to say that I don't want to sit anywhere near Taylor in the press box when the, the Bombers come to Hamilton, because I, I just think that that might be a dangerous place to be. I might be at risk of getting hit by projectiles. But, uh, well, I'm going to be in the, Hamilton next month, so there's your uh, there's your <laughs> warning. So, I'll, I'll say hi to you from a distance. I will wave from a distance. Fair, I'll take that. <laughs> but um, no, as as far as the the MOP race, uh, I don't think it's necessarily been been stolen yet. Zach is still Zach, and he's he's having himself a pretty good year. Vernon Adams has been terrific as well out on the the West Coast, despite the the Lions' recent 
struggles in terms of wins and losses. But uh, but Chad Kelly is a remarkable story. Um, we, I think, all expected him to be a, a capable starting quarterback, uh, but not necessarily, even given his pedigree, given his, his resume, not necessarily an outstanding starting quarterback as he has been so far in his first year. He deserves a lot of credit for being a hard worker, first of all, but also being being humble in terms of coming up here and learning the, the Canadian game. Often, I think one of the impediments to success for, for players coming from big American programs or guys who have, have experienced success south of the border is, uh, is sometimes thinking that it's going to be easy up here. And obviously, Chad Kelly came in here with a different attitude, and I think he's, he's learned the game, and I think that's allowed him to, to play with, uh, with some confidence, with some aggressiveness, Ryan Dinwiddie and, and the offensive staff have continued to put him in good spots. And yeah, there's no question that Chad Kelly has, has been one of the stories and no doubt a, a clear front runner in the, the East as far as that MOP race, at least. Marco, when you look at him offensively and defensively, now if you're trying to defend him, why, what's so difficult with him uh, in terms of containing him He's running the ball effectively, and you know he's putting up three hundred game yard games like it like it's coming out of style like not a style like it's what's difficult in terms of defending him. You know what I think it is. Uh, I think he's just a tremendous competitor. Now he obviously doesn't have the athleticism and measurables of a guy like Trey Ford, yet he finds a way to extend plays, uh, to make off-balance throws in, in tight coverage, stuff that, you know, you usually expect to see out of a veteran quarterback, but here he is doing it with such limited CFL experience. And I've got to admit that I had my doubts uh, coming into this season as to whether he was going to be able to live up to the expectations because in my personal opinion, I mean, you look at his track record, uh, there were a lot of off the field issues uh, when he was in college. There was a very small sample size uh, of actual in-game play with McLeod Bethel Thompson having been the starter in Toronto for so many years and obviously I wasn't privy to what that organization was seeing in practice in the meeting rooms but it, it just kind of seemed like Chad Kelly before the start of the season was being anointed as the next you know huge thing in the CFL and so I was, I was a little skeptical but I must admit that a little past midway through the season um, he's proven me wrong uh, and I just I, I'm very impressed with his leadership skills especially with his young age and his limited um, you know CFL experience as I mentioned but I go back to what I said before uh, I think that he has those intangibles uh, as that a quarterback needs to be successful he goes out there he competes from start to finish and he kind of straddles that line of playing on the edge of you know he's not too cocky to the point where it might backfire on him and get get in his head and he starts you know playing mind games with himself but he's just kind of plays with that edge that sometimes you need and i think it also helps that he's surrounded by a pretty darn good football team in the toronto argonauts you know and i think that's a great point marco that they are a really good team and taylor they're, they could be a team to be feared with as they get better down the season. I am concerned with the fact that they don't have any bye weeks left, and that's, that could be an issue as we get a little bit later into the season when it comes to injuries and that kind of thing. But to a bigger picture right now, and I know the commissioner, Randy Ambrose, he's also talk, always talking about strength in the big city markets. Um in that last game against Calgary, <laughs> there was a little atmosphere at BMO Field and seats were being filled. So maybe a guy like Chad Kelly, as we said earlier, can sell seats. Totally. And I think, if we're being honest, I think Chad kind of rubbed some people the wrong way, you know, in the offseason, just some of the, the, the claims that he's making, the expectations that he kind of had for himself, you know, because we, we've seen that time and time again, right? These these guys from down south who have these very impressive college resumes or had a cup of coffee in the NFL, they think they're going to come to the CFL and they're going to dominate and 99 times out of 100, they don't, 
right? But but Chad, you know, to his credit, he he's backed up what everything that he has said. I mean, you look at the season that they're having, they have not lost a game where he has, you know, played the full game. The only loss was the game in Calgary that, that he left early. And all the games that he has played fully, they're averaging 38 points per game. Like, you can't ask for any more from, from your quarterback than that. So he's been a great story. He has... He has a personality to him too, and stuff. And I think in a market like Toronto, especially, y- y- you kind of need a guy with, with some some charisma and, and stuff like that too. Like that's that stuff's important when it comes to selling tickets to to the casual fan and whatnot. But um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see though, because if he does win MLP, I think he'd be the first first year starting quarterback to win that award since Casey since 1990, um, since Casey Printers did it back in 2004. So it's just something you don't see very often. So uh, he's been incredible to watch this year. You know, Dwayne, obviously you're in the television game right now, and we love to build storylines in television. I uh, think <laughs> big smile there. Um, TSN can't help but kind of align on this right now. I mean, this is this is a selling point for the league. Yeah, it, it definitely is. There are obviously the uh, the Kelly family shots in the the stands every game, and and this is one of the things. I mean, for me living in Southern Ontario, I'm sure you experience the the same thing, Bubba. Is this sometimes this mentality, particularly from Toronto, of their being so enamored by the NFL and particularly by the Buffalo Bills, who are sort of an hour and a half drive away, that. Historically, I, I have shaken my head at the people who would drive past the, the old Sky Dome, Rogers Center in Toronto, where the Argos would play, where they could have watched Doug Flutie in 1996 and 97 to go and watch him from 1998 on, on the other side of the border in Buffalo. Like you had this guy right in front of you and you, you didn't come out. But there there is that mentality sometimes. And I, I do think that, that in Toronto, the the Kelly name and obviously the connection to, to Jim Kelly, who had those great years with the, the Buffalo Bills, Super Bowls aside, that um, that, that means something to the Toronto fans. It's a, a selling feature to the Toronto fans. And the fact that, you know, as as the guys have talked about, that, that Chad Kelly has sort of, unlike many before him, has lived up to his, uh, his advanced billing. Let's go to a different topic here, Marco. I- Nathan Rourke obviously made the CFL proud last year. Like, there's no doubt about it. He was an outstanding player, and he became, as we talked about with Dwayne, a great storyline for everyone in this league to follow. Now he goes over to the Jackson Jaguar, the Jacksonville Jaguars, uh, puts together, I thought, outstanding numbers playing in all three preseason games, yet he gets cut. Marco, was that a surprise to you that the Jacksonville Jaguars uh, released or at least cut uh and put them on waivers. Well, I think on the surface, um, obviously it was a bit of, su- of a surprise, especially considering the success that he had last year in BC and the way that he played in the preseason. But when you begin to peel back the layers, uh, you know, what the casual fan needs to understand is that throughout the evaluation process within an organization, they don't just base it off of the preseason numbers and the stat lines and the highlight plays, you know, that everybody saw rolling over and over on Sports Center. They evaluate everything from the day you walk in at training camp, in the meeting room, the way you conduct yourself, uh, you know, every little thing uh, is taken into consideration. And this is not to say that Nathan Rourke did anything wrong off of the field. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, I think the, the Jacksonville Jaguars made a decision that they felt was in the best interest of their franchise. And they were willing to take the risk to put him on waivers with perhaps the opportunity of coming back and, and scooping him up and, and stashing him on the practice roster. But that being said, you know, I don't think this is the end of Nathan Rourke's NFL journey by any means. And whether he gets picked up on waivers here in the next couple of days, uh, if he goes back to the Jags uh, in a practice roster capacity, or if he even just, you know, sits at home for a little bit and sees how things play out across the league in the next couple of weeks. Um, but obviously, you know, I was disappointed. I was rooting for him. Uh, uh, as were, I think, a lot of other people uh, across the country. Uh, but I, I have no doubt that he's going to land on his feet and then he'll likely get an, uh, another opportunity 
opportunity here in the near future, whether that's in Jacksonville or somewhere else in the NFL. You know, Taylor, it's interesting. There's so many Canadian fans out there that are saying, oh my goodness, Nathan Work has to be better than C.J. Beathard. They do. But I mean, being a backup quarterback isn't, they don't just look for a guy who has, you know, the higher ceiling and whatnot. Like a backup quarterback's job is to to be there for the starter as well, right? Help them prepare and whatnot. And CJ Beathard, no, he's not the flashiest guy in the league by any stretch of the imagination, but, but he's a six-year veteran. He's heading into his third year in Jacksonville. Trevor Lawrence is the guy. They drafted him first overall. He was the highest touted quarterback prospect possibly since Peyton Manning, like like he's on that pedestal, right? So Nathan had an uphill climb ahead of him. I think uh, he kind of just has to pay his dues a little bit. I've heard, you know, lots of people say, well, you know, Washington, they, they stink at quarterback, or this team stinks, stinks at quarterback. They should go get Nathan Rourke and whatnot. But it's it's not that simple. So I think he just needs to kind of pay his dues a little bit. I know he, he probably doesn't want to sit on the practice roster for a year or, and whatnot, but that, that might be kind of where this is going. But but let's not forget, though, he worked out for 12 NFL teams. It wasn't like Jacksonville's the only one that had any interest in him. So there's still going to be a market for him. He just kind of kind of has to go through the process a little bit first. Well, Dwayne, the obvious market, because you can't help but be excited in some ways. You know there was some excitement in some ways from Canadian Football League fans thinking Nathan's coming back to the CFL. Do you envision a situation where that happens? Definitely not this year, as Marco said. I don't. I don't think we are seeing anything close to the end of of Nathan Rourke's NFL journey. Um, he's going to have an opportunity, whether whether it's Jacksonville, whether it's elsewhere. Right, as Taylor said, he worked out for for a number of teams. Um, was signed to Jacksonville with with guaranteed money. That there's a degree of of commitment there that that really spoke to to the level of interest and at least the, the level of competition for his services. And so whether the opportunity comes immediately or a little bit down the road, I think it's going to be worthwhile for, for Nathan Rourke to, to stay down there and continue to explore that. I think we also need to, to bear in mind some, some parts of the financial picture that his practice roster salary, while by NFL standards is, is by no means big money, but you've got to remember he was playing on a on the salary of a CFL rookie Canadian for his first couple of years in the league. So yes, he would be due for a big raise should he choose to come back to the Canadian Football League. But what he's going to get in the National Football League, whether on an active roster or a practice roster, is considerably more than he's been willing to play football for to to this point. So I, I think that he's uh, he's a guy who's patient. He's a guy who's willing to to play the long game and sees the big picture very well. And I think for, for Nathan Rourke, from a career point of view, for him, that means waiting to see what happens in the National Football League, at least for the 2023 season. You know, Dwayne, right back to you on this one, because I know there's a lot of people out there that don't understand. What is it, um, what are the requirements of being on a, a practice roster in, in the National Football League? What, what are your responsibilities? Well, your responsibilities really are, are basically the same as, as being on the active roster in terms of what's expected from your your level of preparation and your your time commitment, other than basically game day is, is going to be a little bit different, right? And and travel days and things like that, that that you're not a part of. But in terms of the practice week, your your level of commitment is is every bit that of the starters and and I would say often more because you're you're trying to advance, whereas veteran starters i don't want to call it complacency but there's a, going to be a level of security there for some of them and so yeah as as a young guy as a new guy and especially at that position uh you're going to be expected to to put in a little bit of extra work if if you want to move forward marco did you spend any time on, on the on, on a practice roster in your days no, I was fortunate enough to uh, make the active roster uh, from week one, and obviously I got put on the injured list a couple of times, but never down on the practice roster. But I've obviously uh, had several teammates who have gone through it, uh, and even throughout one season, you know, they'll play a couple of games, then they'll be demoted to the practice roster, and it can play a lot on a guy's psyche uh, and his commitment. You know, sometimes it. 
it's a lot to digest. It's it's a lot to have to process when you think you know you've made it and you you just dress for a couple of games in a row and you've had some success. And then all of a sudden, overnight, you know, things change, the roster change, and now you're back on PR, you're making PR money, you're trying to figure out what your housing's going to look like, uh, you know, your, your salary changes overnight. So it's definitely a tough deal. But as Dwayne alluded to, uh, you know, I think the circumstances are a little different in the NFL. Uh, I think Nathan Rourke could benefit from spending some time uh, on an NFL practice roster. Um and I don't think we can lose sight of the fact that, you know, it, it, it was the odds were stacked against him to make an active roster right out of the gate. I mean, it's different when you talk about a position, for example, like wide receiver or defensive line, where they're, you know, keeping a lot of bodies around on the roster. Uh, some guys may make the team because they can play special teams. And so that allows them to make it onto that active roster. But when NFL teams are only carrying two active quarterbacks uh, and perhaps one on the practice roster, it can be tough to, to crack uh, the line. Up and so you know, I, I don't think Nathan Rourke has any reason to be discouraged. I think m more opportunities will come, uh, and I don't doubt that he'll be given a fair shake here over the next couple of months. Guys, we're approaching the week in the Canadian Football League that everyone talks about. Well, the CFL season doesn't start until Labor Day. That's where everything gets going. Taylor, obviously, there's a good little relationship with the Bombers and the and the Rough Riders so much that uh, I guess it was Troy Westwood said some words, and then there was something called the Banjo Bowl, which followed the Labor Day Classic, I believe, if that's how that goes. What is it about Labor Day that is so special? And um, and yeah, do you have any uh, special memories of, of that actual date or a game? Oh, man, people in this town go absolutely nuts for Labor Day weekend and, of course, the Banjo Bowl as well. It's probably the closest thing we have to kind of like that college football, like intense kind of rivalry type of thing. I remember growing up that, you know, Labor Day, there'd always be a party to go to to watch the game on someone's big screen or a projector or something like that. Whether you're at the lake or in the city or, or, or you know, people organizing bus tours to go down to Regina and stuff like that. And then, of course, the Banjo Bowl is, I, I always tell people, I don't care if you're a football fan or not, go to that game. You're going to have a great time just seeing all the costumes and stuff everyone's wearing, the, the banjo music that they play throughout the whole game and stuff. It's, it is a really fun atmosphere. That is the CFL at its best. Um, but for me, I don't really have a, a favorite memory. Just, just thinking of that weekend in general, or these two weeks in general, just kind of you know, brings up a lot of, you know, kind of happy thoughts, I guess, and, and good memories in general. But, but I think one that can kind of maybe stands out um, is 2016. Because before, it seemed like this Labor Day game was basically like an automatic loss for the Bombers, basically for every year, right? Like, they just would go to Regina, and it felt like they had no chance uh, at winning that game. But in 2016, that was kind of a sign that, you know, maybe this organization is kind of turning things around a bit. That was, so that was the one where just Justin Medlock, he hit a 43 yarder as time expired, I believe to give Winnipeg a 28, 25 victory. So that one meant a lot to, uh, the Winnipeg fan base, but, uh, but yeah, I think at least half of these games, the Labor Day games, they, they, they've been decided in the final three minutes between Winnipeg and, and Saskatchewan. So it's always a good, good, good game no matter uh, which team you're supporting. So I'm sure this one will be another one too, especially with Saskatchewan coming off of a bye. So they've had a whole week to prepare for the Bombers. So should be interesting to see. You know, Marco, you lived this out as a player and now as a broadcaster. And I think... People would first say, well, what is the rivalry between BC and Montreal? And I don't know if it is a rivalry. You could probably tell us more. But I also think to a, a long period of time, BC and the Alouettes were the best teams in the league. Yeah, obviously, you know, it's unfortunate that the Owls don't quite have that historic rivalry uh, like the Bombers and Riders do on Labor Day. Um, but obviously, you know, uh, Montreal and Vancouver, uh, BC Lions have had their fair share of battles over the years. Um, BC historically has been a very good football team, uh, Montreal as well. And, and so for these guys, you know, I don't think they need any extra motivation 
motivation uh, going into this week's game, especially coming off that big loss uh, against the Bombers last week in Winnipeg. Um, but personally, uh, you know, I consider myself quite fortunate to have had the opportunity as a player to experience the Labor Day Classic and the Banjo Bowl in 2018 uh, when I was with the Riders and the fact that, you know, we were able to win both of those football games. You know, Mosaic Stadium is a special place to play, period. Um, but you add that, that little touch of, of Labor Day Classic to it. Uh, it makes it even more special, uh, and I'm thankful for having had the opportunity and, and very grateful for having had the opportunity uh, to have been a part of that when I was in Saskatchewan in 2018. You know, Dwayne, uh, kind of like what we have in the East Division, there's the Toronto, and then there's the Hamilton, and there's all the, the sort of mixes that go on there, the sort of Toronto fan, Hamilton fan, Hamilton versus Toronto, if you know what I'm saying. They, they, that, that, they, and, and, and it's at, well, Iverwind Stadium for all those years, now Tim Hortons Field. And that was a rough place for the Argonauts to, to say. And I'll say that as a media member and a fan. Like, it was hard for the Argonauts to come into old Iverwind Stadium. They got roughed up pretty good. And you know this to be true. You lived the same thing, though, in an interprovincial uh, battle between Calgary and Edmonton. How hostile was it? You know, it's. Uh, I'm not sure that it's it's necessarily the same level of of hostility in the stands as uh, as there is in in Southern Ontario. Quite honestly, I mean, the the thing that I'll say about the the Argos Tiger Cats rivalry is, I grew up in a family of Toronto Argonaut season ticket holders, and so I grew up at Exhibition Stadium at games all the time. Now, my parents always went to to the Labor Day game in Hamilton. They never took my brother and I to Hamilton when we were kids. And I, you know, I never really thought about it until, until years later because I, I actually played my first ever CFL game in Hamilton. And I thought it's so weird that I've never been in this stadium. But when I saw some of the things that went on in Labor Day, I realized why my parents never took their kids there on, <laughs> on that day or for that game. Is that, yeah, like, I mean, we could get into a, a whole show about the crazy things that happened there. But it's as much as... In Southern Ontario, in, in the CFL, fans are cheering against each other in the CFL, but tend to cheer for the same teams in virtually every other sport, right? People in Hamilton are, are cheering for the Toronto Raptors and are cheering for the Toronto Maple Leafs and cheering for the Toronto Blue Jays because they're the, the closest team. It, it's funny how just polarizing the, the CFL rivalry is. Yet in Southern Alberta, where they literally are cheering against each other in every possible sport. The rivalry is intense, but I, I don't necessarily find the, the in-stadium temperature or climate to be, uh, to be quite as hostile on, on Labor Day. What about as a player, Dwayne, when, when you would face those, those Esk then Eskimos? I mean, I guess the temperature was a little higher there too. Uh, you could definitely, there was definitely a vibe in the stadium when you talk about just the, the buzz, the excitement of, of the day that, that, yeah, the Labor Day game or games when you consider the, the back to back that used to be a Monday, Friday, that, uh, the buzz in the stadium was a little different, that it did feel like a big game. A lot of the times it was, it was your first afternoon game, your first daytime game of the year and kind of signifying the second half of the season and the start of this stretch run and and the fact that yes it was always against the the provincial rival it was it was always a pretty cool day to be in the stadium that's for sure so that leads us into the games this week guys um i'll throw it open to all three of you guys right now of course lions at alouettes bombers at rough riders argonauts at tiger cats and then the elks at stampeders taylor the game of the week is if I don't say Bombers and Riders, I'll be banished from, from Winnipeg. So uh, I, I got to go with that one. But, uh, but yeah, like I said before, though, I mean, I, I know the Bombers have won five straight. They're nine and two, sitting in first place in the West and whatnot. But, but don't forget about Saskatchewan. They, they've shown some flashes. And like I said, they're coming off of a bye week as well. We've seen how important that could be, especially this season. Um, so, yeah, I think that one's going to go down to the wire. 
Well, hopefully Zach doesn't throw uh, two interceptions, <laughs> two pick sixes in, in the first half. I mean, that could set you up for a, a, a real tough comeback for, for, for the Bombers, especially playing in hostile territory. Uh, Marco, your thoughts the game of the week is? Well, selfishly, I need to pick uh, the BC-Montreal game, and I'll tell you why. Because earlier this season, the Owls went into a similar stretch where they lost three in a row, and they lost those games to Winnipeg, BC, and Toronto. After that, they went on a four-game winning streak, and then all of a sudden, we saw them start climbing those power rankings, and everybody's starting to wonder, well, hey, you know, are they for real? Are they actually a good football team? They're coming off with three losses. They're stringing together four wins. You know, what is the identity of this team? And now they find themselves in a very similar portion of their schedule where they're in Winnipeg last week. They've got BC this week, and then they've got Toronto back-to-back. Now, they're 0-1 in those four games with the big loss against Winnipeg. So I think this is a true measuring stick for the Alouettes to see what kind of football team this is. Are they for real? Can they beat the good teams in the CFL? Are they, are they only able to go get their wins against the Ottawa's, uh, and the Calgary's of this league? And so that's why I think this is a crucial game for this football team, uh, especially going into these colder fall months as we approach, uh, as we approach the playoffs. Well, Dwayne, unlike our other two guests, you have no allegiance any longer. You have no one to, no fans that were going to attack you like Taylor and Marco. So who who are you liking this week? Which game? Yeah, it's funny because because I I came into this prepared to go with the the BC Montreal game, but Marco stole my my pick. But very similar reasoning, yeah, that you have a BC team that that I don't know if you would say might have shown a couple of cracks in recent weeks, and a Montreal team that's that's had that win streak recently that in a league that's been divided kind of a, you know, top three bottom couple and a bunch of teams fighting in the middle that, that Montreal is one of those teams trying to prove that they belong with the, you know, the Toronto's Winnipeg's and BC's and, and an opportunity to, to demonstrate that. And, and obviously Vernon Adams being, uh, being back in Montreal um, creates some interest there, but Marco picked that game. So I'm going to pick the battle of Alberta, Calgary versus Edmonton. Uh, similar reasoning, though. When you talk about playoff picture, you've got an Edmonton team that now has some momentum. Calgary is the team, as you know, Taylor alluded to. People kind of seem to be overlooking Saskatchewan a little bit, but everybody keeps mentioning, you know, Edmonton maybe going after Calgary and taking away a playoff spot from them if, from them if they're able to continue that momentum. And so, two teams that are are pretty hungry that are are both kind of one fighting to keep momentum one fighting to to turn its momentum around and potential playoff implications when uh when you look down the road on this one and season series and so on and and so i think there's plenty of reason to be excited about that game and we mentioned earlier in the show the the excitement that trey ford has brought and then you you kind of balance that as well with the the excitement that the Calgary offense provided in that loss against Toronto that uh, that gives plenty of reason to be excited about this matchup. Dwayne, right? To, that's a great point that you just brought up there. The 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 explosion of offense that they showed uh, at uh, BMO Field against the Argonauts, and that was a 39-36, 39-33 uh, loss, whatever that was. That was so close. Uh, is was that the real Calgary offense that we saw? I mean, it, it had been struggling. I guess Jake Mayer hadn't thrown a touchdown pass in four games. Uh, is this more like it? I think for Dave Dickinson's crew. Well, I I think Dave and and Jake certainly hope so. But this is you know this one comes with a to be determined label that uh, we talked about a little bit during the broadcast. That I'm sure is. For fans of the Calgary Stampeders, there was a level of excitement in watching what they did offensively in that game, but probably also a level of frustration in asking the question, why can't it be like this all the time? And so I think what you're looking for for, from Calgary is to prove that, yes, what we saw against a very good Toronto team is in fact the the real Calgary Stampeder offense, and they'll have an opportunity to try and demonstrate that in back-to-back games against Chris Jones and the Edmonton Elks. Well, folks, nothing left but the games to be played. And we certainly appreciate our fine trio here that have joined us on the CFL this week to express their opinions, their thoughts about the hot topics of the league. And as always, I know we get lots of response from our 
listeners, viewers, and uh, Taylor, if people want to talk to you about the Bombers and a little bit more, and maybe some of our angry Tiger Cat fans have some words for you, how do they contact you? Well, they can find me on, on Twitter or X or whatever the heck it's uh, being called today, <laughs> at, at TaylorAllen31. And, of course, they can, if they really want to help, they can sub- subscribe to the Winnipeg Free Press and uh, enjoy our, our, our great CFL coverage. Um, but also, I just wanted to mention, though, there is some breaking news. Nathan Rourke just went unclaimed on waivers, and he's expected to, to sign with Jacksonville's uh, practice squad team. So, so there was some, some late breaking news for the show. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that's where you could find me. The CFL this week. That's why we have you guys. Fantastic. Great to update the, our people on uh, on that situation. And great news for, for Nathan as well, too. Marco, where do we find you? Well, so M.O. Bruyette on all platforms. And if you're ever at Percival Molson Stadium, we're up in the press box on the south on the north side of the stadium. Sorry. Our windows always open, whether it's raining, snowing. Uh, we're always there. Feel free to walk on up and have a quick chat uh, in between commercial breaks. Are the hot dogs really that good? I couldn't tell you. I've been vegan for almost eight years now. So... <laughs> Unless they're serving vegan hot dogs that I'm not aware about, unfortunately, I can't uh, I can't provide any guidance with regard to those. I heard those Lafleur hot dogs are pretty good that they serve for grind out loud. <laughs> Dwayne, I, I I'm not quite sure. Are you on social media? Uh, are you hiding? Are you hiding? I'm on it, but I I tend not to actively participate in social media for uh, for a variety of reasons. So if anybody wants to know what I have to say, you got to just watch the games. On there TV. you go. Yeah. Thank if, you so much. Hey, you, guys, again. Sorry? I was just say, if you want to complain about Dwayne, just write to the CRTC. Or, or, or send a strongly worded letter to Bell Media. It, it'll eventually make its way to him. Yeah, exactly. Spectacular stuff. Thank you again so much for joining us. And, of course, hey, to you CF, CFL fans and listeners, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, hey, if, whether you're listening or watching on, on YouTube, drop us that message. Give us a review, five stars is always great. We appreciate it. We love putting out the content for you. And as I always like to say, hey, this is not the only show here on the Thai Cats Audio Network. We have some outstanding programming that not only focuses on the Thai Cats first, but also the CFL. And of course, we got the Morielli and Hit Show, which is probably leading the ratings right now because those two are something else if you know them personally or even when you remember them on the football field. But we appreciate it, folks. Labor Day, it's always a a classic time to enjoy the Canadian Football League wherever you are across the country. Enjoy the football. This has been the CFL This Week. I'm your host, Bubba O'Neill, and you've been listening on the Ticats Audio Network.